and hi this is andre ferguson and you're now tuned in to denial zero radio hello andre welcome how are you hey how are you deny i am good i am good so shout out to the fabulous barbara jones for the introduction um so i work, we to work with the phenomenal saver travis of here in our agency and she told me about all the work that you're doing with your film so kind of let's talk about like what your film is about and how it came to be uh yeah so the film 33 black frog uh is a documentary of my father um who served in the united states navy uh back in the 1960s but it's also a his you know entire life story so going back to the era when he uh grew up as a young man in fort myers florida during the jim crow era and then it's going to you all the way through uh him joining the united states navy and then uh reaching one of his american dreams of becoming the united states uh navy seal frogman also known as udt seals okay definitely definitely so when it comes down to, well, well, first of all, what inspired you to want to create this documentary? Mm. Um, yeah, this is, uh, my, my father came up uh, one weekend and we were sitting around with uh, one of my friends and we were talking about uh, the Navy SEALs, uh, which is uh, one of the most elite military forces on the planet, right? And um, he was talking about his time when he served and uh, the actual first African-American Navy SEAL was inducted into the African Arts Museum in which my dad served with him. Um, but they also had his him as uh, one of the first uh, had him as the first uh, Navy first skydiver on the Navy skydiving team. Mm. And I was like, wait a minute, Dad. I thought you were the first African American skydiver. He was like, I was, but you know, don't worry about it. I was like, no, we need to need to get that right. And he was right. like, no, it's it's fine. And I I said, well, why don't we do that documentary I've been talking to you about for about twenty years now? <laughs> so um, it's been very difficult and tough to uh, uh, document. Uh, a person of his caliber because you know in the, the navy udt seal program it's like a fraternity right and they right. it's a creed that they hold and they kind of keep things secret so they don't talk a lot of, about uh the missions and what they do and um so while i did try to uh do a documentary on him about 20 years ago um when this issue came about he was willing to do the documentary in which I could point out that he was uh, the first African American skydiver on the Navy skydiving team. I know that yeah. was a long, that was a long road there, but no, uh, absolutely, yeah, no, no. So when it came down to having those first conversations about what happened, mm -hmm. what what did it feel like to to know? what really happened back then mm. so him being my father of course there's some heartfelt you know and emotions that that stirred in me uh wanting to make sure that the truth was corrected um but it was you know even when we started uh the documentary he called me about five in the morning and said oh i don't want to do it you know because whatever happened to me there or you know whatever they say or whatever it doesn't really matter and um but it mattered to me right and so i still kind of pushed him into uh talking about his uh time and service there and the things that he accomplished but i also reminded him that um you know he's a uh, a father uh, a, a son, a brother. Um, his life is just not all about being a frogman in the United States Navy. So I wanted to talk about some of those stories of him growing up during the Jim Crow era. Definitely, definitely. 
What does it feel like to know that your father is a part of some incredible history? Um, to me, it, it, like you said, incredible. It is incredible to him. Um, you know, he's a guy that, I mean, when we first started, he was like, man, I don't know about doing this. I don't want to toot my own horn. I'm not that type of guy. You know, he's real low key, humble, uh, uh, you know, s served the military, followed the, 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 uh, the creed, you know, of the Navy SEALs, UDT. And, you know, he's just not a person that, you know, uh, that wants to be talked up. Right. So um, I myself am very happy to get his story out because I think that his story can help inspire others, you know, throughout our future generation. Um, just seeing the resilience and perseverance that he had to became to become one of the, you know, most elite fighting force, uh, I say, on the planet. So I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the story that we were able to tell. Um, this is not going to be a documentary about, you know, he jumped out of a plane, went in and killed Osama bin Laden and all this type of stuff, right? But you know that these people are capable of doing that type of thing. So uh, just knowing that he has those capabilities and uh, no fear, courageous, um, you know, I'm very proud of... Uh, him and his story. So what, what were some of the challenges that you've had to overcome in creating this documentary? Um, I think the biggest challenge is, uh, or what, or continues to be uh, interviewing him. Um, he had, uh, interviewing him is, is very difficult um, because he has to think before he speaks to make sure, you know, he, uh, honors the creed of the seals and UDT and 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 but still try to provide me with information that may be useful you know to the viewing audience um, that may be inspiring to you know help them uh, solve whatever difficult problems they may have in life definitely definitely so you recently premiered your film. What was that like? Yeah, so the, the first premiere was uh, at the AFI Theater in Silver Spring, Maryland. And uh, man, it was, uh, I just, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it was breathtaking just, you know, seeing something that you, you know, worked on. I've been working on this documentary for, for over five years, uh, collecting historical photos and video and doing research at the National Archives to make sure that I, you know, the, the story is authentic, right? And um, then to see it come up on, on the big screen with and, and see the emotions of people reacting to what they're hearing and seeing on the screen um, and listening to the score, um, you know, because my background is in the entertainment industry, so I was a uh, a music producer, uh, more than film producer, you know, at one time, but, um, I brought all that experience to film and, you know, I produced this with, uh, the guys that I produced music with 301 MG and, uh, just seeing how the, the music and the film, you know, brought the emotion to the people in the audience. It, it was fantastic. What was one of the main things that you kept hearing when you got feedback regarding the film? Yeah, so um, the big feedback from the film, uh, I think the message that everybody received from the film was, uh, don't give up, never quit. You know, so anything that you put your mind to and that means something to you, you know, that you hold dear to you, that you want to accomplish, uh, you should never quit, right? Definitely, you know, and I think that's what people forget is that when your heart is in it, just keep going. Yes, that's, because it's gonna, it's, you're gonna find a way for sure. That's right, and um, you know, there was a lot of uh, roadblocks um, during this process of, of creating a film, also where um, 
but I had to get it done. And that's, that's the one thing that uh, my father uh, speaks about in the film, right? He, he was presented a challenge. Um, the challenge was probably more than he could handle. Um, like you said, he's not saying that he would die. He's, he would have to die, but he had to get it done. Right. So, you know, so you just never stop, don't quit and, and you'll get it done. You know, just have faith in what you're doing. What was one of your most memorable moments when you were filming the documentary? My most memorable moment, uh, I would say, um, the, there, I didn't know uh, that the the Navy uh, UDT SEALs honor their uh, fellow comrades who pass away uh, by having a swim out. So when they, when a, uh, I'll just say a frog man, when a frog man passes away, they're known as a frog man, right? So SEALs, UDT, frog man, right? So when a frog man passes away, um, retired Navy SEALs, they have a ceremony um, down in Fort Pierce, uh, Florida, where they swim out the ashes of the frogman to honor their life. Yeah, so that was very uh, emotional for me um, because one of the frogmen that, um, that they swam the ashes out, he was a friend of my dad's and he was a very kind person uh, who was very good friends with my dad and a good person to me uh, growing up in my youth. What do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions about the Navy that you were able to help clear up during this film? Mm. Misconceptions. Um, what this film will do is um, give you a brief education on race and the military and um, how the military was desegregated and the truth of why the military was desegregated. And those were some of the very surprising uh, information that, that I was able to uncover. Yeah, that is a good question. What, hmm. cause I know what happened when it came to, cause we, we talked, I remember we talked about the fact of Red Tails, which when it was the, um, the story of the, the, the Tuskegee Airmen and, right. and how they were able to break the barriers. So what do you what do you think was the moment that made people think maybe we do need black folks in this mm-hmm. arena and to treat them properly because they're doing really, really well. And they're helping us, you know, to kind of helping us to keep our people alive. Yeah. So um it's it's all about politics. It, you know, it doesn't matter how many planes they, they shoot down it's about uh you know winning votes right so um de- desegregating the military brought favor on whatever political party was you know uh in place at that time so by desegregating the military they were able to get more african americans to to get political votes Oh, darn it. Wasn't that an actual merit? <laughs> <laughs> you would hope, no, no, real talk. You would hope that it would have been uh, a merit. You know, yeah, I, I wish merit. I could. No. I wish, yeah, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's what it was, right? Um, now, we know it was crazy. Um, it was very expensive to um, to fund a black and a white military, right? right. So you had, you know, I mean, even the blood was separated. You know, if you went to Red Cross, you could, you know, <laughs> yeah, black blood, yeah, white blood, you know, white forks, you know, w- what black spoons, you know, and it, it was, you know, the white people, they had to set up their own latrine and black people their own latrine. So it got, you know, it was crazy. It was just, it was uh, unbelievable. So some of those things were, um, What do I want to say? Some of those things were, you know, some good things were accomplished by desegregating the military, but it wasn't about, you know, 
bringing everybody together. It was more about uh, winning the White House than right. You know, right. And what's more cost effective? <laughs> it, it, it it didn't matter. It, you know. Now, once they desegregated um, the military, it was cost effective, but that wasn't the reason, right? Why they desegregated the military. They didn't care. They were going to spend the extra money to not have a white person use black blood, you know, if they're injured or, you know, have white tents and black tents and white utensils and black utensils and white dining halls and black dining halls is, you know, it didn't matter then because the, because of, you know, discrimination, racism, things of that sort that were practiced during that time. What is the best piece of advice that your father gave you? Um, man, he has a lot of sayings. Um, I think a, a big one for me is smile in the face of adversity, you know, so, um, you know, there, there'll always be challenges that, um, come before you, you know, um, you just face those challenges, uh, be a joyful warrior, right. And, you know, just persevere and smile in the face of adversity and get through that conflict and be ready to solve the next, uh, conflict. Most definitely, you know, and I think that's, so important, especially now, you know, because we're going into it. Oh. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, was there any advice that your dad gave you regarding dealing with people from the Jim Crow era? Um, I don't think there was any advice, but um, one thing I did learn um, after interviewing him was that um, where where they thought they were segregating black people away from white people, that it was a, a good thing for, I guess, white people. Well, in his mind, or just from talking with him, he felt that black people were insulated you know, from racism because it was a segregated town mm. right, that he grew up in. So, uh, you know, they had their own cleaners, they had their own shoe store, they had their own grocery store, they had their own barber shop. They didn't have to go on the other side of the tracks. You know, as a matter of fact, he didn't see a white person until he went to get recruited for the military. So he really didn't have to deal with racism and still, until they got their first television. Really? Right. So when he got his first tele, the first television, that's when he saw news where, you know, black people were being hung and, you know, killed and KKK and things of that sort. See, it's very interesting how it literally was out of sight, out of mind. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, you know, um, he, he, he actually experienced, uh, uh, racial, uh, issues when he joined, you know, joined the military. That's when he, you know, he, now he's on a ship with, you know, 500 right. white, white people. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's awesome. So after going through this entire process, what advice do you have to give to young filmmakers? Hmm. So, um, young filmmakers, what I think they should do is, you know, um, it's hard, um, you know, completing the film. Um, you never think it's ready. Um, so I've had filmmakers come up to me during screenings and, you know, kind of ask me, hey, how, how do you do this? How do you do that? What do you advise? And my advice is, you know, if you have an idea and you have a thought and you have a good idea of, you know, a project you want to do, um, don't don't feel like you have to you know come up with a million dollars and do all that just go do it go do it just go shoot it make the mistakes fix the mistakes 
you know, the more you get out there and shoot, the more you interview people, the more you um, experience filmmaking, you know, from do everything, do the filming, do the editing, do the coloring. Don't get stuck and think that you need other people to do everything for you. You just go out and do it, study, research, and try again. Just try to get better each time. Uh, you go and uh, approach filmmaking from uh, from a videographer perspective to producing or directing. Just do it. That's the best advice I got. <laughs> I love it. No, just do it. Absolutely. Because I think a lot of people don't understand that the power is literally in their hands. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's the, the way it's the way you tell a story. It's the emotion you put behind it. Especially when it comes to documentaries, it's, right. about the, it's about making sure that that you're that you're accurate, right? In, in what you're saying, making sure that you care about the people that you're talking about, so that you can show the emotion. Right. That yeah. So, what I would advise them for store, you know, first of all, you know, kind of study, research what you're getting ready to get into, find out, you know, what the standard is, because if you're trying to get your film on a certain type of platform, then you need to know what their standard is, right? And so once you understand what their standard is, then you apply that to what you're doing, right? Even telling the story, you know, Hollywood has a way that they want a story told, you know, so you're going to have to follow that format and just kind of plug and play your story into their format, right? And, and I had to learn it the same way, you know, I, hey, I wanted to I wanted to come a lot harder than I came, you know, but, you know, I knew there was a certain way to tell a story and, you know, I had to, um, I wanted, you know, all audiences to be able to um, enjoy the film and learn something from the film. So, you know, to do that, you're going to have to put your story into a certain format. I mean, the most common is, everyone talks about is the hero story, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the hero lives in this world and then he goes on his journey and he runs into a problem or conflict, you know, and he has many solutions to that conflict. And then, yeah, and then he has the solution, right? And so, you know, if that's the format they're looking for, that's, that's the one you got to put it in. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So what's next for this film and where can people find it right now? Okay. Uh, the film's currently playing on Amazon prime. So you can, uh, search 30, 33 black frog and, uh, pull it up on Amazon prime. Um, it's also, uh, you can also get it on YouTube stash military channel and the next project, uh, I have two projects on the on the burner. Um, I'm working on the script uh, to turn this documentary into a feature film. Nice. Um, I'm, I'm getting close. <laughs> so I've been writing uh, very diligently to try and finish that up soon. And then I have uh, another film uh, called The Pitch, um, which... Um, it is if you wanted to think of what type of film it was it's like i don't know if you've seen friday night lights it was like a football film back in the day but the pitch is a soccer film and it depicts nice. uh okay. it depicts a coach and immigrants who migrate from honduras el salvador um countries from central america they they smuggled themselves into the United States during the Obama years, uh, during the mm. and then they come to this uh, English as second language high school along with uh, MS-13 gang members uh, who are trying to recruit them for uh, to be an MS-13. But the coach has to manage them to uh, try to keep them out of trouble and win soccer games. That's going to be powerful. Yeah, it's going to be great. I can't wait to do that. 
Yeah, yeah that's going to be very nice. Mm-hmm. And the crazy thing about that is like that that is such a realization for so many kids right now. It, it's it's, to, whether to be a part of the music scene or be a part of the gang scene, be a part yeah. of the music scene or be a part of the gang scene. And it's like, and the, the thing is that a lot of them don't understand that only one of those options has a future. That's right. Um, they're, they, you know, I don't want to tell you the movie, but uh, you know, a lot of times they, the gang members, um, they work from, you know, because of technology, they're able to work from Central America through the United States and work out their devious plans or whatever. And, you know, it's, uh, it's that this is uh, a lot of this is based off of true stories. Right. And, uh, so during the Dream Act, um, they had a lot of, they released a lot of, um, they actually did release people from jail. You know, I know we hear Trump say, oh, this is, but they actually did release um, a lot of juveniles from jail who smuggled into the United States. And when they come to our high schools in the United States, they don't really, they, there's no background check, right? So they get into the high school and they end up being uh, MS-13 recruiters who go after kids to do their deeds. So that's happening. Yes. So that's a reality. So you got to educate your kids and make sure they understand the power that they have and and that that they don't have to go down that route because there are so many other options for them. Right. And, And and in the story, that's the the coach's job is to like manage all of that, right? He's trying to manage keeping them away from the MS-13 recruiters and he's trying to manage giving them life skills, right? Something they can use once they graduate from high school. Yes. No. Yep. As, Don't want to give you too much. Yep. And that's I it. love it. I love that's gonna that's gonna be super powerful for sure. Um so when everything is said and done. What do you want your legacy to be? Hmm. Uh, you know, right now, I just want to, you know, produce films that uh, can help, you know, you. Um, I'm a guy that's solution driven, so I like to, you know, come up with strategies and plans to help you solve difficult problems in life. So that's what I'm trying to bring to my films, right? real life situations and and just ways to problem solve and resolve conflict you know in your life or prop difficult problems that you may be trying to solve and i'm trying to do that through filmmaking yes i love it i love it so go ahead and give your shout outs please oh wow okay shout out to my amazing uh, musicians, 301 MG, 301 Media Group. Uh, that's uh, Nate McFall, Steve Mitchell, Dale Mitchell, Colbert Collins, Andre Johnson, Thomas Crossan. And I hope I didn't miss anybody because I have before. <laughs> and uh, shout out to mom and dad just for uh, allowing me to uh, tap into their, their life history and display it on the screen. Um, shout out to Nick. He knows who he is. Uh, the person who, um, just, you know, guy put in place for me to help me get distribution for this film. And, um, and, you know, everybody else that's contributed to, uh, the success of, of, you know, making the film. And shout out to you and, uh, Seba, where is she at? Seba. 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 Oh, oh, no. <laughs> Seba. Yeah. <laughs> she uh, is here. Listen, definitely shout out to Seba Chavez, the PRNS agency, and shout out to phenomenal Miss Owner of Reservation 7 DC, Miss Barbara Jones, with the connection. Oh, definitely. Bar- hey, Barbara Jones, that's my girl. Definitely shout out to Barbara Jones. Um, she she was here from the beginning when I first started this documentary. Um, I've been working with her and Curtis Blow. Shout out to Curtis Blow for 
uh, getting involved during the early part of this documentary and, and just being there uh, for support. And uh, yeah, Barbara Jones, that's my girl right there. Yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead and tell everybody where they can find you, follow you, and most importantly, book you. Yeah. So if, uh, yeah, you can just go to 33blackfrog.com. Um, all my information is there, email, phone number, whatever, call me. Um, I'm accessible. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to, <laughs> you can just email or call me. I'm just a regular guy, you know, and, uh, you know, feel free to call me anytime. Absolutely. And happy Thanksgiving to everyone who is listening to the Niagara Radio and Next Legacy. We appreciate each and every one of you. Please have a phenomenal time with family and friends and continue to express what makes you unique. Amen. Thank you, Danya. I appreciate you having me on today. Absolutely. No problem.